it's so great to see so many of you new faces, familiar faces, all in 3D. Um, let's start with some introductions. So I'm Cecil Robert Michon. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. I live in Seattle, and I've been uh, involved in SIG cluster lifecycle for about three years now, but who's counting? Um, I'm a maintainer of several projects, inclu including Cluster API, Cluster API Provider Azure, and Image Builder. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. So I'm Fabrizio Pandini. I work uh, from OneWare. Uh, I'm six cluster lifecycle tech lead, contribute to Cluster API, Kubernetes, and other projects in the SIG. Um, and I'd love to get to hear about you all. Um, so quick show of hands, who here is using one of the cluster lifecycle projects or right now with their employer? Okay. How many people are contributing or have contributed to the SIG in any of the projects? Cluster API, KubeADM, COPS, yeah? How many of you are not contributed yet but are hoping to become contributors after today? Yeah, okay, great. Let's make that number go up at the end of the talk. All right, so um, numbers, uh, who are we? So we're about 400 developers across 80 companies. That's a pretty impressive number. Um, and we have 21 sub-projects. Uh, I don't know if there's a count of who's the top number of sub-projects in Kubernetes, but I think we might win. Um, and then over the last two years, we've had thousands of issues and PRs and comments across our various projects. So what is our mission? Um, the Cluster Lifecycle SIG mission is to simplify creation, configuration, upgrade, downgrade, and teardown of Kubernetes clusters and their components. What that means that we're trying, is we're trying to make Cluster Lifecycle really easy and so reliable that you don't have to think about it anymore. Okay, let's, let's have a look at what, what we do to make uh, this vision uh, possible. So we, uh, as Cecil said, we have 21 projects. A way to look at this project is, is to consider them into four different categories. So the first one is uh, Node Bootstrapper. Uh, these tools are basically, the goal of this tool is simply to transform a machine into a Kubernetes node. The second group and Kubernetes is a tool that falls, uh, that falls in this category. Then we have the second category, which, uh, which are where most of our projects are, which are Kubernetes provisioners. These tools basically take care of a set of machines, the, the machines that build the cluster, and in some cases, it, they take care of also the infrastructure where those machines uh, are run. And uh, the first project that, that we developed in this area were uh, KOps and Kubespray. And then basically some, uh, some time later, we started the entire Cluster API uh, family with Cluster API and the, all the Cluster API provider. We have uh, about 15 of them in, uh, in our SIG, but there are many others outside the SIGs. And there is also the, the, the Cluster API operator project that is in this area. The third set of tools is the uh, cluster add-on manager. So when, when you have your cluster, basically you need a set of add-ons like CPI, CNI, CSI to get your cluster running. And so this set of tools are trying to solve this family of problems. And the last family of project is, is, is kind of mixed. We have uh, tools like Kubernetes that provide a, a simple cluster for developer experience, or we have a tool like ATCD ADM or image builder, which provide, uh, which support basically the, the implementation of other tools. So we have a lot of great tools, but also over time we have learned that uh, one does not fit all. There are many opinions, ma ma many different needs when, when it comes to cluster life cycle. So what we did, we, we build a set of well-defined interfaces and this make it possible, basically for, each, for everyone, to pick their own set of tools and eventually also to plug in custom tool uh, all, made, all made. What is really important is that at the end, well, all, all these tools start working together thanks to this interface. Basically, it happens this Voltron moment when basically you, start, you finally you can start 
forgetting about cluster life cycle, and, and finally you can start focus on building great application on top of Kubernetes. So m moving on, uh, uh, we have a limited time. We cannot talk about all the projects if all of them deserve uh, great attention. Uh, let's talk about uh, two of them. Uh, I talked briefly about Kubernetes. So Kubernetes was probably the first project started in the SIG. And it is, uh, it, the goal of this tool is to be a best practice Kubernetes node bootstrapper. It is very limited. The UX is, is designed to be simple, init and join. And it provides a cluster which is reasonably sure, it covers the 80% of the use case and allows you to uh, uh, address all the, the, the other 20% if you need it. The scope is limited. Uh, we, it does not take care of CNI. It does not take, take care of machine uh, infrastructure provision. It is really designed and meant to be a tool to be used by higher level uh, tool like Kubespray, Cluster API, et etc. Et All right, and then on top of Kube Admin or Kube ADM, both are accepted and valid. Um, we have Cluster API. Um, Cluster API is a tool that provides declarative APIs to manage fleets of Kubernetes clusters. Um, so what that means is we're extending the Kubernetes API through CRDs to define desired state of your Kubernetes clusters, and then with controllers, reconciling that cluster state across various infrastructures. Uh, one of the great things about Cluster API is that it's completely pluggable, which means it's uh, at the core Core, uh, cloud and infrastructure agnostic. Um, and then there are many providers, I think we're at 30 plus now, uh, across very, very different infrastructures that allow you to use Cluster API in your preferred environment. Um, it's very powerful for managing a fleet of clusters, as I said, from a single management cluster. Uh, so think many, many clusters across different tenants, different infrastructures uh, from the same management cluster. And it implements an immutable machine deployment model, which means uh, we have rolling upgrades and all that good stuff so you can upgrade, downgrade safely. All right, and we're gonna do a little digression here and talk a little bit about cluster API updates because we're very excited. Okay, so the first one is we are introducing a release team for the project. Um, this is a really big deal uh, because we are trying to improve um, our predictability and reliability of releases um, to make it easier for users and providers and uh, contributors to know when releases are coming. And we are also trying to uh, make it more sustainable for the team um, to have a more diverse and bigger set of contributors uh, being able to contribute to the release process, as well as using this as an opportunity to improve our tooling, our automation, and our docs around release. Um, so this is a great area to get involved. We've just finalized the release team for the first uh, release cycle upcoming, but if you're interested in participating, please uh, reach out in Slack and we can um, get you involved for the next one. So the, the next feature that we would like to talk about is uh, extensibility with runtime SDK. As we discussed before, having great extensibility point is, cr is crucial for the success of the uh, C cluster life cycle. And uh, recently we released, we released this new feature in Cluster API that basically allows external tool to plug in into the cluster life cycle. This is, let me try to explain this by, by an example. Let's imagine that we are a company that you need uh, uh, for our uh, approval before creating your cluster or before updating your cluster, or you need to, uh, I don't know, to check uh, your provider if there are spare capacity for a specific team or, or whatever. So this kind of process are never going to be implemented in Cluster API because there are so many, there are so different in, in, in every other company, okay? So instead of trying to solve uh, this problem, what we did, we created this uh, extension point based on our runtime SDK. And what happened? If you develop uh, your own custom component that implements uh, uh, your specific process that could be for eyes or, or whatever, and then you deploy this, pro uh, this process in the cluster and you register it to Cluster API in a way that is very similar to the way that you register a book, just to, to, to make it really concrete, then Cluster API will start, will start calling 
your component at well-defined moment in, in the life cycle. That means that when I create a cluster, before the cluster get actually created, so that before machine starts to, to spin up, the cluster API will call your component, and your component can basically answer to cluster API and tell, hey, wait a second, I'm not ready, uh, there is not yet for our for as approval, uh, or please go on. And th that's a very cool feature. If you are interesting, uh, we, we don't have time to do a demo, but if you're interested in Pygmy, uh, I can show you and give uh, more details. And just to finish the, this brief uh, digression on cluster API changes, what, is, what we like to highlight is that we have a lot of innovation and most, and most of this innovation comes from user. It comes from real use case, not, not, not anymore from the maintainer. For instance, we are, we are implementing uh, support for IVAN providers. And this innovation comes from one of our user companies. And uh, this is really great. Uh, we have uh, implemented support for Autoscaler from zero. Uh, we have uh, implemented a cluster API visualizer, which is super nice to take a look at what the cluster is and learn about cluster API. And this project has been developed by a student that, by the way, now it is starting his career in cloud native. So. Cluster API is, is, is good also for your career. Uh, and, and many more, we are implementing support for structure logging, so we integrate very well with all the monitoring tool. Uh, uh, another company, Daimler, has started uh, in, uh, implementing Kubestat metric for Cluster API, so better operation in production. And many other, where there are going discussion on uh, managed uh, Kubernetes for cluster API, so AKS, uh, AKS, GKE, and so on. There is work uh, about uh, how to improve uh, add-on management. There is a, pro uh, a project about uh, cluster API for Elm and uh, a lot of discussion in this area. And we are working in managing node label and streaming line label propagation. Lots of cool stuff. Um, all right, let's go back to the future and talk about our roadmap. Um, just a few highlights of things that are kind of top of mind for us right now, uh, if you're looking to participate and get involved. Um, so first off is uh, cluster add-ons. Uh, we need to uh, improve our story around how to install essential add-ons on clusters. Right now, um, there's been a lot of different solutions that we have uh, kind of looked at in the past, it's a very complex and opinionated space. Um, there are a few solutions that uh, were homegrown within the SIG, uh, like we had the cluster add-ons project that was mentioned earlier. There's cluster resource set, which is a cluster API feature for installing a YAML one-time apply after the cluster comes up. Um, the reason this is becoming more important right now is more and more components are moving out of Kubernetes. So you have CSI drivers migrating out. Uh, you have uh, cloud providers migrating. So now users are more and more having to like add plugins and install components on top of their Kubernetes clusters uh, and not having that be installed for free when they spin up Kubernetes clusters. So we're trying to make that story a little bit uh, easier and uh, better for users. Uh, and we're exploring ways of also uh, not reinventing the wheel and reusing some of the existing uh, great tooling that's out there for managing packages and add-ons, uh, such as Helm, GitOps, Cap, et cetera. And all of those uh, are, like doing that is also part of our mission as a SIG is to not uh, reinvent the wheel, but instead leverage the work of others um, in our SIG. Um, so there are many solutions out there. Uh, we're currently in the exploration um, phase. And if you're interested in helping out, um, that's also a great area to get involved. All right, next up, um, also a very hot topic, manage Kubernetes. So uh, Cluster API and the other uh, SIG cluster lifecycle projects were originally designed with self-managed Kubernetes in mind. Um, that's going back several years ago, managed Kubernetes services were still at their early days. Uh, now we have a lot of major cloud providers that have released managed Kubernetes services where you don't manage the control plane, you only manage the worker nodes. Um, we have had lots of users come up to us recently and tell us, we love what you're doing with Cluster API, but we want to use that with managed Kubernetes. Um, so they want the GitOps, the 
uh, declarative spec aspect of CAPI, but they also want to have the reliability and all the built-in native features of managed Kubernetes services. Um, right now, the current state is we have uh, working prototypes in CAPZ and CAPA for AKS and EKS, respectively, uh, and then GKE support in CAPG is in progress. Uh, but what we're trying to do is really to come together as providers and make sure that we're improving the consistency across providers so that users have a consistent experience across the different uh, providers and that they can manage fleets of clusters across providers without needing to really care about the little differences between each one. Okay, the last area where uh we see our project grow and, and improve is about uh, edge or disconnected cluster. So what is the need that, that our customer that you bring back to us? Kubernetes is, is nowadays used everywhere. And the problem is how can we make Kubernetes work well in an environment which is not a data center, which is not a, a cloud provider? Those environments have a lot of challenges. Uh, they are. And, and also they come with a great variety. You can go from shops uh, with a couple of machines to very little device with maybe uh, the, uh, connectivity once a week. So they can given that this space is so, so opinionated, so different, so complex to tackle, we are taking a, a very uh, prudent approach. So basically, we, we first uh, have to learn to, cr to crawl, then to walk, and finally we can run. So, let, let, and uh, we would like to do this journey with all of you. Uh, we have a couple of ideas and, and quick win that, that we are already implementing or, uh, or working on, uh, like uh, refining support for a single node cluster. So, a, a single machine that can host both, both the control plane and workloads. We are making, uh, we are doing small changes in order to make our tooling resilient uh, to slow uh, network or temporary disconnected network. So how do we cover when the connection go back, uh, uh, giving good log message in this situation and so on. And the next step will be basically start to investigate, understand how can we tackle the most the uh, hostic environment, which are where uh, basically uh, the, the one with less resources. So how can we downside the, fro the, the, the footprint of Cluster API? And, uh, and how can we work well in these limited uh, environments? The, the good news is that uh, we, we can be creative. We can leverage on the strength of the, of, of the project. And so we have a couple of ideas. Uh, uh, for instance, to creating a super fast bootstrap without can, uh, kind. Uh, we would like to experiment in moving our management cluster is a pod. So you can basically move it in, in, a, in edge location, e also the management cluster, and you, need, you don't need any more the connection with a central management cluster. Uh, we are experimenting on faster machine bootstrap, so trying to figure it out what makes machine bootstrap slow, uh, how to make images smaller, so all these kind of problems, and also how to improve our routes. And uh, also we, we are taking a look at features that already exist in operating system uh, like AB rollout or uh, cloud native op uh, operating system like Flatcar uh, and other bottle rocket and other, uh, so we can leverage and, and, and take the same the advantages of the immutability process at edge. So, given that Cluster API is a hot topic, there is a lot to talk about, uh, there is a, gr a great community of providers, how to get more info. So we are just at the beginning of this conference, and I would like to give you a list of talks where you can uh, have uh, some more information. So, uh, today there will be a tutorial about how to develop your own Cluster API provider. Uh, there will be a talk uh, about uh, user experience, uh, uh, some, some user telling how they build on multi-tenant providers, so a provider that can work across multiple clouds, which is interesting, and also spin down from Cluster API to CSI, CPI, so it is an interesting talk. Uh, 
Another experience, uh, user experience about uh, how to use Cluster API with Virtual Cluster and Kata for security. Uh, on Friday, uh, we have an, another tool from you, for user uh, from Adobe explaining uh, uh, how they scale the Cluster API with Argo CD and vCluster again. Uh, there, there will be a talk about uh, Cluster API and Bird Metal and another tutorial about to how to operate Cluster API in production, uh, some tips and tricks, and uh, I will give an uh, early shout out to the two team working on tutorials because I know that they put a lot of effort in preparing them and they will be great. All right, so this is all great. Now, how can you get involved? Um, so there are a few things you can do, uh, which are pretty uh, standard recommendations. You can read our contributing guide, uh, tend our office hours, uh, look for good first issues, help wanted, uh, help improve docs and testing, developer tooling, et cetera. But really, I think there's, if there's one single thing that you can take away today, and my advice would be to honestly just show up, um, introduce yourself, turn the camera on, say hi. Uh, we're all people, we all wanna help, um, and you know, sometimes it can be easy to be the new person in the room and feel like everyone's talking about stuff that's like way above your head, but really there are other 20 people in that room that are asking themselves the exact same question you are. So be that person that raises their hand and asks the question. Um, if you haven't, I highly encourage you to go on the Kubernetes Slack and then just say hi in the Slack channel of the project you're interested in, whether that's Cluster API, KubeADM, Image Builder, any of them, just introduce yourself and uh, Tell us why you're here and what, what interests you. And then that can be a great way to get started. All right, that's the end of our content. How are we doing on time? Plenty of time, 15 minutes, so as many questions as there are. This is the part where you ask questions and we answer. What's the difference, like the ranch or some of the cluster management tool versus uh, using this API? Sorry, can you say that again? So the, there are some cluster management tool like Rancher and some other things, right? So manage the cluster and manage the life cycle. So what's the major difference between this and that? Um, yeah, so um, I think the main difference here is that cluster API is uh, using Kubernetes to manage Kubernetes clusters. Um, so that's kind of our concept, like turtles all the way down, Kubernetes all the way down. Um, so we are extending the Kubernetes API itself for Kubernetes cluster management um, and uh, using controllers and all the built-in features of Kubernetes to make managing Kubernetes clusters easier. So that means you can take all your existing uh, tooling and gestures like kubectl apply to uh, manage the life cycle of your clusters. Uh, so for example, let's say you have like uh, a node pool and you want to scale it up, kubectl scale dash dash replicas, done. Um, so it's things like that I think that we're trying to differentiate on. Um, and then also we're part of SIG cluster lifecycle, uh, which means we're like direct sub project of Kubernetes. We're not a vendor. So we're trying to work with all the community and every different infrastructure, right? So we're not like prioritizing one cloud or one infrastructure over another. It, yeah, if I may add something, I, I think that one way to look at this is that Cluster API and all the projects that we, we build in the SIG are kind of building blocks that the community, which is basically the sum of all the company, Rancher, Microsoft, WMware, uh, and uh, many others, are where, where all, all of us are basically put uh, together this building block, this set of common practice, then then are using in all the product, because if you look at Rancher behind the scene, they are using Cluster API. And they have a team, which uh, we had some discussion, which is stepping up to use it even more. In Microsoft, in VMware, we have products that are built on top of Cluster API, on Kubernetes, uh, and all the other providers, and which offer you a set of service, so a kind of magic soup on top of the, the same common uh, and, and uh, ground. So 
what we are building is here is kind of a foundation or a basic capability that many companies are using. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Rafael. I'm from uh, Well Life Studios. Uh, I have a, um, a quick question. So obvi obviously uh, you're uh, putting a lot of work into trying to uh, optimize bootstrap times, uh, which uh, I'm sure everybody appreciates. Uh, and uh, I was wondering whether it's being to considered to add a um, warm pool-like functionality to the cluster API providers uh, for the various different types of clouds so that we can pre-bootstrap our nodes and have them shut down and ready for a uh, rollout. It's being implemented in some provisioners like COPS uh, to a limited extent, uh, but that would, would be something that would really help in keeping costs low uh, at the same time as having uh, lightning fast uh, uh, provisioning of new nodes, uh, because obviously bootstrapping can take a long time. So, okay, I, I think that if I got the question right, there are a, a couple of points on it. So the first one is, is bootstrap. Uh, and and uh, yeah, cluster API, are, uh, uh, and so we, we have different solution in the, in the SIG that manage down from infrastructure to machine. Some of them are going through traditional pr provisioning, create a machine, install software, and finally get Kubernetes. In cluster, uh, some others, like cluster API, already took a, a slightly different approach, uh, where basically when you create a machine, they create the machine using an image that already has, has pre-baked uh, components in. And this is a first way that brings two benefits to you. One, the booster is a little bit faster. Uh, second, uh, what you get in your machine is kind of predictable because uh, once you test this, uh, the, the image in, in CI, basically you know that all the nodes of the same Kubernetes version, we, we work all the same. So we kind of already made the first step down this path, but uh, we, we, can, we can do more. We, we can do more to minimize the size of the image. We can do more to make our image more secure, et cetera, et cetera. If you think from a, from a kind of point of view, what we have in the community today, it is some set of example of image, but then every company that builds on Custer API, basically they offer their own uh, specialized image, uh, images. Uh, what we can do as a community is that since every company is, is solving the same problem, why not bring all, all this idea upstream and factorize so everyone can benefit of, of it? So this is the first part of uh, the question. The second part was about managed solution for spinning image, uh, spinning image uh, I think like uh, node pools, uh, something like that in cloud providers, uh, if, if this is uh, so. Some of our uh, Kubernetes manager already support this. So you, uh, when you create a machine, instead of uh, going through the process of creating uh, for the machine, so the VM and then uh, bootstrap, uh, 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 our, our bootstrapper basically delegate this to the cloud provider. So basically you can benefit all, all the, about all the machinery that the cloud provider uh, gives you to replicate uh, image faster, to bootstrap faster, to pre-locate. So we, we are leveraging on the infrastructure. But I can tell you that there are discussion, uh, there was discussion for instance on Monday in the contributor summing for people which are doing, using Cluster API uh, in, uh, with bare metal. And there was discussion how basically to embed similar behaviors in their own provider so they can have a pool of machines ready to become a node when there is the need. So yeah, there is, there, there is uh, um, work. Uh, I think that the best answer is that every provider it is trying to leverage on what the infrastructure offer instead of reinventing the wheel, which does not make, case, make sense. Yeah, the only little thing I'll, I'll add is the, uh, just like the infrastructure providers are also like modular and pluggable, the bootstrap providers are as well, right? So there's nothing that prevents you from going and writing your own bootstrapping provider with your own bootstrapping mechanism if that's something that you're looking for as well.
Hi, um, this is all great stuff. So you talked about the uh, future projects, and I was wondering, like, you talked about the cluster API at Edge. Yeah. Uh, what's the motivation behind it? Is it something that the maintainers came up with, or is, uh, are these like real use cases that uh, people have come to you about? Take it, Eva. Yeah, I think this is mostly coming from providers who have uh, needs, so like mostly users uh, who've come to us and say, hey, like I want to run this on bare metal or I want to run this on this infrastructure, and uh, I, that's where it started from. Yeah, I, I think what, what is important is, is to consider that this is a community. It's built by people. So we work in this community. We kind of uh, are a liaison between our company and the uh, open source community, so we bring our use case up, but most of the use case come from issues. So if you have special needs, open an issue, describe your problem, or come to the SIG, to the office hour, and just show up and tell, hey friends, I, I have uh, this use case, are you thinking about it? And so people start Thinking maybe, and I'm pretty sure that if you have a problem, someone else in this room, someone else in, in the office hour have the same problem. And so when we, we reach the critical mass that we have enough clarity on a use and enough critical mass basically to implement it, it, it just happened. So uh, this is the beauty of the, the open source. Really, sometimes it just throw an idea and then things fl 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 flourish up. This is why you have to show up. Because by just opening an issue, you can influence the, what happened in a product. If your idea is good, other people will say, hey, this, this, this thing is cool, let's go on with it. And yeah, we, we are not inventing the roadmap. The roadmap is a sum of uh, needs, idea. It is a collaborative work. Yeah, and that's true for all the things we talked about in the roadmap, by the way, not just Edge. Like, every single thing we talked about was brought to us for, you know, user needs and different companies wanting to explore going a certain direction, so. Hi, uh, thank you so much for sharing, and thank you for uh, laying out clear area where a newcomer can join. Um, I've never been a maintainer. I think it's really important to kind of like know where I can land my footing at. Um, I'm actually curious on your journey on how you become a maintainer and like how was the ramping up? How, how was the, I guess the first three months of joining the community? I can go first, I guess. Yeah, that's a really great question. And actually it's funny because Fabrizio and I were just talking about this earlier, right before the talk, like how do we get more maintainers? And so I'm so glad you asked. Um, so um, for me personally, I started just um, showing up to Cluster API office hours like three years ago. Um, the first time I joined, I think they were doing like some code deep dive or something. Uh, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> um, I'm, it was just really like uh, intimidating, right? Because there's all these concepts that I didn't understand and everything. But, um, I, I think the part that really helped me was getting to know the people, um, so like making relationships and then uh, using those relationships to learn um, and you know know which areas needed more help, where I could you know get involved. That whole like chop wood carry water expression that's like really really helpful in open source to become like a maintainer because the maintainers are the ones in the end that are gonna be responsible for project health, right? You wanna make sure the project is sustainable, people aren't getting burnt out, releases are happening, uh, the community is growing, and so that's the kind of work where like, it might not seem like the most fun work, I mean, I, I think it's fun, but you know, it's not always like add this glamorous feature that my company needs. Sometimes it's just like, make sure that we have more tests and that they're green. Um, so looking at for those areas of work where like the maintainers seem like they're burnt out and being like, hey, do you want me to help you with that? I think that's a really great way to help. And then the other thing that I would say is like, uh, if you're interested in becoming a reviewer or a maintainer, tell someone, like don't just keep that as a secret and like hope that someone will notice you and be like, hey, do you wanna become a maintainer? Um, I think the best way is to like, just reach out to one of the maintainers and tell them like, hey, like I'm, I don't know if I'm there yet, but I'm interested in becoming a maintainer one day. How can I get there? 
where do you need help? And anyone will be ha like happy to help you. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the key is don't, don't be shy, show up. I'm working in this ecosystem by five years, still have uh, imposter syndrome uh, because there are so many bright people, but at the same time, they are all welcoming. When, when I started, I just sent uh, an open an issue, why do, do you don't change the default for this flag? And it was five line of test, uh, a, a simple question, and then, and then I, everything started from them. I, I, I met a lot of friends all, 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 across, all across the world. So it, it is really a nice experience from a, both a professional because war, uh, point of view, it became my, my work after a couple of years, but also from a personal point of view is, is a great learning experience. So I highly encourage everyone to give it a try. I think we had another question somewhere over there. The last one, because we have time. Yes, uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, yeah, I think uh, to run the class API, you need to run the operator on another cluster, right? Uh, we call, maybe we call it a meta cluster. Uh, how do you efficiently manage that uh, like an uh, original cluster? Like, is there any are you asking about the management cluster? Right. I yeah. think, re, tell me if I'm wrong. I think the question was, how do you manage the management cluster? Right, so um, it's outside the, the control of cluster API, right? Yes. And uh, if you are a sysadmin, you need to spend uh, like additional time to maintain that cluster. Make sure cluster API operator is healthy. Yep. Yeah, any thoughts like, uh, or best practice like uh, to manage the management cluster? Yeah, okay, thanks. I, I guess I can go first. And, um, so uh, that's a great question. Um, that's a question most people that start getting deep are like, wait a second. <laughs> You're telling me I need a cluster to create clusters? So how do I create that first cluster? So um, there are a few different uh, possible solutions for this. Uh, the first thing to know is the management cluster. It's, it can be any Kubernetes cluster. It doesn't have to be a cluster API cluster. It can be uh, a local cluster, it could be a cluster running in a managed Kubernetes service, it can be really any cluster as long as it has like the prerequisites and minimum version requirements. Um, then I I've seen people solve this a few different ways. Um, there are uh, ways to, uh, so one thing you can do with cluster API is you can have um, a cluster managing itself. So for example, you kind of, you create a temporary bootstrap cluster that's running locally or wherever. Um, and then you create a first cluster API cluster with that. And then you can use uh, our uh, CLI called cluster CTL to move the resources over to the workload cluster that you just created, uh, all the CRDs, and you basically make that cluster itself a management cluster that manages itself. Um, so that's one way you can do it. Um, I've seen users do that and have like one per region or something like that, depending on what your infrastructure looks like. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know if you yeah, want to share. Just, it. just to add on this, I, I think that one of the beauty of Cluster API is that at the end, Cluster API is like any Kubernetes component. So if you want to operate it, when you set up your Prometheus you, you, or, or your login system, you are managing also Cluster API like you manage any other operation. So this is the beauty. So it kind of fall into into the same category of any other of NGX or on uh, any things that you run in Kubernetes. We have metrics, we have uh, uh, logs. So this this one. Is. Second, I think that uh, if it comes to um, best practice. Uh, one of the most important things of Cast API is that Cast API, one management cluster, allows you to manage how many workload clusters you want. But of course, there are trade offs. You have to think carefully about not having a single point of, uh, of failure. So, typically, the recommendation is to split up your workload cluster across many uh, management clusters. I know that companies more or less settle about from 50 to 100 cluster for each management cluster. Mm -hmm. uh, people doing edge goes up to 200. But yeah, it depends by the, your, let me say, risk appetite. 
Uh, but yeah, having more management strategy could be a, a, an idea to, to operate and manage risks. Can I add one more thing? Sorry. Also, uh, one small thing uh, to note is that um, your management cluster itself, it's not keeping your workload clusters running. So that means if your management cluster goes down for some reason, your workloads are not going to be down. Like they're still going to be uh, up and running. The only thing that will happen if your management cluster is down is that you won't be able to do lifecycle operations, so like scale up, scale down, delete, upgrade, all that stuff. But um, there's also like what's really powerful is you can do backup and restore of your management cluster resources, like any CRD uh, and controller, which means uh, you can uh, stand up a brand new management cluster, back, uh, restore all those resources over, and then adopt the running cluster and be back to running in no time. Um, so the, work, the management cluster needs to be up and running. It's not ephemeral, but it's also disposable. Like, you know, you can also treat, like all your clusters, treat it as cattle, not pets. Um, so you don't have to be attached to it or anything like that. We are really are at a time, so we need to <laughs> stop here. But we are free, free to come here and um, and ask questions to Cecilia and Fabrizio. Please join me in a round of applause for her. Thank you. Thank you.